we're going to get things started today. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our third and final of our Conservation Areas uh, workshop webinar series. Um, this is the third of our three part series. So on behalf of our workshop committee, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. Uh, both Dave and, I, Dave and I have been looking forward to this uh, special edition of our webinar series, although he is running the show in the background. So you won't see Dave, but know that he's here making all the magic happen uh, behind the scenes. Um, mine will be the voice that you hear moderating this webinar. I'm Tori Fisher. I'm our Conservation Parks Administrator and Dave Orr is Superintendent with Conservation Parks. Uh, both of us have the pleasure of working for Credit Valley Conservation and we've shared the responsibility of co-chairing this year's workshop on behalf of CDC. Along with our delightful and talented planning committee who are in the audience watching and working behind the scenes. Hey team. So we'd like to share a few housekeeping items with you to start uh, to consider during this webinar. So there is no public chat feature within this platform. Uh, closed captioning is available should you require it, but please be aware there is a slight delay between what we are saying and what you're reading as the audio translator plays catch up. Uh, we will be doing a Q&A during this webinar. Um, our panel will be answering questions at the end of the webinar, not at, at the end of each speaker's presentation. So please type uh, your questions in the Q&A feature. Uh, you'll see the icon featured um, on your screen here so you can find it. Um, and we do ask that you address your questions to one specific speaker or to all speakers, as in Ryan, how cold is it in Thunder Bay right now? Uh, or all, how did you manage to produce a video presentation for today's webinar while closing for the season and juggling a few million other commitments? Um, <laughs> parks are amazing, aren't they? <laughs> it's always astounding to me how we manage to accomplish so much when it feels like there's never enough time in one day. And uh, finally, please stay tuned after the question and answer. Uh, we have a very special video to share with you that you will not want to miss. So um, we do truly uh, wish we were able to offer the in-person workshop this year um, because it's become such a must in, uh, much anticipated mainstay in our yearly calendars. But this is 2020. We're working with what we have and uh, we hope you'll enjoy this virtual format. Um, though it's been a challenging year to say the least, uh, our committee knew that we needed to come together and share and collaborate like we do so well. It's important um, and we will continue these efforts uh, as long as we need in order to um, remain connected. OK, now to the good stuff. Um, so we all know that site tours have been an essential piece of the workshop for years. Um, it's a chance to get out of the parks and see what other CAs are doing how they're doing it, special projects they've got on the go, unique physical attributes we each boast, um, and eat some delicious lunch before we head to the workshop. Um, so this year we thought, why don't we do a virtual visit to some of the CAs that are a little harder to get to before driving to Aurelia. Um, we had three CAs rise to the occasion, and I really did mean what I said before. Um, I mean, thank you sincerely to our presenters for essentially producing short films uh, and uh, crafting unique presentations for all of our visitors or all of our um, attendees to to watch. It can't have been easy, but they are fantastic. Um, so we have with us today Kevin Money, um, who is the Director of Conservation Services with Essex Region Conservation Authority. We have Team North Bay Mattawa standing by with Troy Storms, Manager Lands and uh, Stewardship. Adam White, who is the maintenance supervisor, and so much more. Uh, Sue Buckle is the manager of communications and outreach, and Paula Loranger is the community co uh, relations coordinator. We also have Ryan Mackett with us, who is the communications manager at Lakehead Region Conservation Authority. Again, each of our speakers will be presenting uh, one after each other, so we will be opening up the floor to questions and answers at the end of the webinar, not after each presentation, and please do stay tuned for that special presentation afterwards. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, Kevin Money. Take it away, Kevin. Hi, um, and welcome everybody. Thanks for watching and, and tuning in for this uh, for this event. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking uh, all the Conservation Area Workshop Committee, committee members. Um, without your hard work and commitment, these types of uh, uh, events and interactions wouldn't actually happen, um, and it's a lot of work. So. I really appreciate that. We're a big, strong supporter of that and glad that you guys are able to implement a workshop just in a different way this year. 
Uh, I also want to thank the staff um, who, uh, who were involved in this video. Um, uh, many of the staff uh, were, were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time while we were out on site conservation area and, and therefore got uh, asked uh, to participate um, in, uh, in an impromptu way. Um, and then finally, I want to thank uh, Danielle Stubing and, and Aaron uh, who actually put the video together, our, our very dedicated and talented communication staff. Um, so I really appreciate their work on this effort uh, as well. Um, today you're going to watch a, a brief video about Holiday Beach Conservation Area. Um, it was a, uh, a rundown conservation area in dire need of a lot of investment in TLC. Um, and with a lot of support, this, uh, this site is on the road to recovery um, and is a site that we're now actually proud of. Uh, and I hope you enjoy uh, the virtual site tour. Thanks. Welcome to Holiday Beach Conservation Area in Amherstburg, Ontario. We're on the shore of Lake Erie right now. Holiday Beach Conservation Area was originally a provincial park. Uh, it was built in the 1950s by the province of Ontario. Um, and approximately 15 years ago, the Conservation Authority entered into a long-term 30-year lease uh, to manage the property as a, as a conservation area. Uh, it's still owned by the province of Ontario, but it's managed and operated like any of our other conservation areas uh, in the Essex region. There's a lot of existing aged infrastructure in the park. We have a, a long-term capital project and plan in place for this park now, and we're, uh, we're very slowly, year after year, making a lot of improvements in this site. Uh, we're currently at our gatehouse, uh, which is the entrance area to Holiday Beach Conservation Area. Many of the facilities around here in terms of the parking areas and our gate infrastructure has changed significantly. Um, we now have a new modern automated gate system with two entry lanes, um, automated pay system, many parking spaces in front of our gate for the, for the general public to use. It was designed to allow for large vehicles to get through, such as RVs. Uh, those changes and modifications came about 10 years ago with the federal grant that we were very lucky and fortunate to get. One of the real key features associated with what we did here at the, the gatehouse is, is our point of access entry. We put in two automated gates. The second one is actually a pay and display kind of a model. Uh, the unit itself is actually solar. We also have a secondary system at our gate where we actually use the FOB to gain entry to the park for all of we hand this out to all of our seasonal pass holders and there's also a, a secondary associated keypad on the side of the machine it creates a huge amount of versatility and control in terms of providing access without actually having staff here it's a huge cost savings and a huge time saver for us I'm standing in Holiday Beach Conservation Area. This is our seasonal campground. It is very well maintained. Uh, the sites are well spaced out. Even though the park doesn't have maybe a water slide and water features, it's still a very popular destination. Um, we are actually full at our campground right now. There's a waiting list for people to come in as new campers. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is we have this uh, large 200, 200 acre property that uh, has a hawk tower, a natural beach, a natural playground that we're putting in here. And uh, it's just a real popular area around here. You can see that the, the campsites are, are just beautiful. Um, a number of years ago, half of this campground had no services at all. Um, so we were able to work uh, through an employment grant and actually upgrade the facility so that the entire campground had uh, electricity and water. We do have a dumping station that all the campers use. 20 amp service is the original hydro that was put into the park. Well, the 50 amp service is the newer uh, system that we upgraded. About three years ago, we shifted to a, a user pay system for hydro. So we actually put in meters um, at every individual campsite. So off to my right here is one of the master meters. Uh, that particular unit measures and calculates the electricity used for about half the campground. We can actually just scroll through and about half the campsites um, and then with that we can calculate their electricity bill for the year. 
Uh, so behind me is one of uh, the washrooms that we have in the park. We have three large washrooms in the park. This one services our campground. We had an uh, old style uh, MNR Parks Ontario washroom here. Um, unfortunately, uh, that structure uh, was burnt to the ground. Um, so we had to replace it. So this is essentially uh, a Parks Ontario design. Um, we have five showers in the unit. We have full laundry, washer, dryer, um, and male and female washrooms uh, it, within this particular structure. It was an insurance build, so it came at the price of our deductible. Uh, which was not very much in comparison to what this building actually costs. One unique uh, thing about this particular facility, as well as the entire park, uh, is that we don't actually have septics on site. Um, we all run on a four sewer main. All the sewage in the park is actually pumped to a, a, a municipal system where it's actually treated. So right now, uh, we're standing in front of a, a newly built cottage that the Conservation Authority built. Um, it replaces an old warden's cottage that, that used to be in the park. We replace it with this new piece of infrastructure. Uh, we used a prefab building built in a factory and assembled here. Um, we've built the deck ourselves, brought utilities, um, not only to service this unit, um, but also so that we could actually add additional ones in the future if we wanted. Um, this cottage has been open and rented for two full seasons now. During the summer, it's fully booked and I, I we're actually noticing um, an uptake in terms of bookings um, in the shoulder and during the winter season now as well. Uh, it's a source of revenue for the park, which is greatly needed. And you're, you're essentially at the water's edge within a, a conservation area. So it's very private. You don't have neighbors. You're surrounded by the wildlife, you have all the amenities of the park, um, all the local wineries just outside the park. So it's a really nice location for someone to get away for a weekend or, or a week or two. Well, now I'm standing uh, in front of Holiday Beach's newest building. Uh, it is a, an eco structure, so to speak. Um, it has a series of solar panels uh, which power the building, but has two uh, hot water solar panels, so that heats the water um, that's used by the visitors who, uh, who enjoy this building and who come to visit Holiday Beach. It was an existing dilapidated bathroom. We actually had to close it for about three or four years. Um, before we were able to, to obtain the funding to, uh, to, to rebuild it and repurpose it. So one of the nice features about this new building is that we're finally able to get a fully accessible family wash, something that we haven't had before. And at the same time, we're do it, able to do it in, a, in quite an environmentally friendly way because if you look up, you can see all the natural light that's able to penetrate into this building. Um, all the lighting in, lighting in this building is all on, on sensors, so either motion or light driven. Um, so this building um, actually gets a great deal of its uh, natural light from the outdoor based on the positioning of windows and sun tubes. So this is the original part of the building, um, and it's where we have the washroom. Um, so above me you can see some light tubes. Um, we put three of them in on the male and the female side, um, which a lot, a lot of light in the actual structure. We have waterless urinals, low flow sh um, sinks, um, and, uh, and just two uh, toilet stalls in here, and one small hand dryer. Everything in this building runs off of solar. The, uh, one of the big energy draws in, a, in any kind of a washroom uh, has to do with ventilation. Um, so rather than using traditional ventilation, what we're able to do is actually take advantage of lake breezes instead. So if you look up at the top, what you see instead is screens that bugs can't get through. Um, and that is how the building is actually ventilated. And that was one of the reasons we were able to get away with um, put having this uh, building entirely on, uh, on solar. Um, so these limestone ledges were off the original building and we reused these. We were able to salvage them and reuse them. Um, and then this stone was salvaged. I believe this came from, this is the original cobble on one of the original bridges that spanned the Canadian U.S. border. We also wanted to make sure that this building had all the functionality and versatility needed for a beach washer. So what we did was we installed exterior showers at this site. And uh, again, the hot water that comes out of these units is, uh, is heated from the sun. So this is our old electrical infrastructure in the park. Uh, this is where all the hydro runs to. It's built uh, probably in the 50s or 60s to service the entire facility in the south end of the park. 
um, and it's extremely dated and old. Uh, this week is going to actually be replaced with brand new infrastructure um, on the inside of our remodeled workshop. This is uh, part of the original building that was uh, built when the parks Ontario were here. Well, the existing shop wasn't uh, designed specifically for our needs. This was basically an open shop with a office, laundry room, and a, and a bathroom. We've also added, uh, added a cottage, which uh, uh, required an updating on our uh, washer and, and dryer facilities. For a long time, we've made use of our portable classroom facility. Recently, through uh, generous donation, we've been able to create the new outdoor classroom facility. The addition of this facility allows us to host two groups at one time. Students often arrive uh, with a full bus, so 50 to 60 children. This way we can have one group in the classroom and one group outside. It also expands our outdoor educational opportunities overall. It means that the Conservation Authority can welcome students throughout the year and can also utilize this space during special seasons like hawk migration for events and activities where we may have guest speakers, public lectures, musical performances, or other activities on site. So we're at the Holiday Beach uh, Playground. It was designed uh, approximately about a year ago. We tried to use as much of the natural area that we could. Stones from the Amherstburg Quarry, benches that are uh, made from local wood. The features that we have at uh, this playground is uh, a stepping log. We have uh, benches that can be used for seating or uh, climbing on. We have uh, the walking steps. Um, and we have, of course, the gem, which would be the climbing wall. Uh, some of the challenges, uh, the area, we're uh, low lying, it's quite level, uh, the water levels are high and uh, it's wet. So some of the challenges was just to uh, um, concentrate on the drainage, uh, providing good drainage for the area so that uh, the foundation of the playground or at the climbing wall uh, would be safe for the kids to climb. Well, right now I'm standing on one of the small boardwalks and I look out overlooking Big Creek, which is a provincially significant wetland and one of the draws to the Holiday Beach Conservation Area. So Holiday Beach is, uh, is on the shores of Lake Erie, um, but it's also right up against Big Creek Wetland, um, which is a, a beautiful, productive wetland um, that has beautiful views, as you can see behind me. So the infrastructure, this infrastructure that we're standing on was built approximately one year ago. We typically build these boardwalks and platforms during the winter time with our own staff. Right now I'm standing on one of the many boardwalks in the park. Uh, we have at least four or five boardwalks. We had to uh, overcome a, a number of obstacles, primarily related to species at risk within the park. This is prime habitat for Blanding's turtles, which is a, a threatened species, uh, and we, we have a large population here. We actually had to build a floating platform for an excavator to go on in the middle of winter for us to then drive in the supports and pillars that had to go straight down into the bottom of the wetland here. Um, in order to not damage the, the bottom of this wetland. This particular project is, is definitely a significant upgrade for the park. We had a very old rickety boardwalk that was uh, closed to the public for, for at least a year or two. So this is a huge improvement for the park and, uh, and all the visitors that, have, that, that enjoy this site. So Holiday Beach has a series of uh, biking and or walking trails through it. We have a small network of trails here. Um, and we're actually looking at expanding that network of trails, creating what's called single track cycling. Uh, our target is to, to build about 10 kilometers of a uh, single track trail um, within our properties here. One of the unique things that we've tried to do or that we're looking at doing is actually creating a wetland and building a wetland and with the excavated fill, build some of the, the mountain biking features um, that the uh, cyclists are interested in. So right now I'm at the base of uh, the Holiday Beach Hawk Tower. The Hawk Tower was actually uh, originally built in the United States and was brought over in about 1988 and it was reconstructed on this site. We have to do periodic maintenance and we get an engineered study done every two years to ensure that it's safe and stable. Um, because of COVID-19, we've had to close our tower this year, however. Um, we just can't maintain the, the safe uh, physical distancing required by the province. Um, but we 
will be able to go up the tower and, and take a peek from the top. We're at the very top right now, overlooking Big Creek. Big Creek is one of the larger wetlands within the Windsor-Essex region. Um, Point Pelee is obviously our, our largest one as a national park. And beyond that, we have Hillman Marsh, which is a conservation area and Big Creek. This, uh, this particular location is perfect uh, for viewing the fall raptor migration. Uh, this site um, has thousands upon thousands of birds, uh, raptors, uh, fly overhead at this particular juncture. Um, they fly from across um, all over Ontario and probably a little bit of Quebec um, and they hit Lake Erie and rather than flying over Lake Erie um, they follow along the shoreline um, and jump over the Detroit River which is not that far from us um, and then carry on south so so we'll see massive numbers of uh, raptors fly through this area every fall um, we have a number of organizations that we work with, um, primarily the Holiday Beach Migratory Observatory. They're a tremendous partner in terms of communicating the importance of raptors uh, to any of the visitors here. Holiday Beach Migration Observatory started back in 1974 when a bunch of the University of Michigan students and Detroit Audubon members discovered that Holiday Beach was one of the best places to come and watch the fall migration of hawks. What's important is, is a number of things. One, just more about the birds themselves. Two, we're trying to determine what the populations are doing. All of this data is being collected and we get a better in understanding of what the population index is across all of North America. So we get to know which species are doing well, which species aren't doing well. And that's really why, why we're doing it. Every uh, duck hunting season, we rent out four separate duck blinds within the park and two additional blinds just down the road from the entrance. Basically, hunters pay a $50 fee to get the blind for the entire day. It's been a, a real successful year. We've just implemented a new online registry program. So the hunters basically apply on a website and they are given the uh, the date and a permit for their dash and they're able to come out here and uh, enjoy a, a day of hunting at the park. One of the, the lesser known things about Holiday Beach is, is that it's fabulous habitat for an endangered bird called a prothonotary warbler. Holiday Beach is one of the few areas where they actually nest in all of Canada. Um, some of the previous research has said that there's been as few as a, a dozen nesting pairs in all of Canada and we're fortunate enough to have um, probably two to three nesting pairs on average every year um, and they actually are producing. Um, so, so we actually have people from the recovery team uh, for this endangered bird um, come out and monitor and install nest boxes and it's a great collaboration and, and working relationship with them. But obviously uh, it does become an issue in terms of traffic management when we have very eager uh, bird watchers and photographers wanting to gain entry to the park and get great views of these endangered uh, very small but very colorful birds but at the same time we're trying to create some space for them so periodically we actually have to shut down our trails um, and work the, with the Ministry of Natural Resources Conservation Officers in order to try to do some enforcement out here as it relates to uh, people management. The Conservation Authority has a great relationship with the Purple Martin Association who actually put up and maintain um, Purple Martin housing within our wetland area. So they come here, they're very dedicated um, to come here, monitor, record and, and clean out all the nest boxes. Uh, so it's a great relationship and a great way for uh, these volunteers to participate in, uh, in contributing to, to improving our local natural environment. So one of the biggest issues within Windsor-Essex County that we face along our shoreline is, uh, is erosion from Lake Erie. Over the last three to four years, we've seen a dramatic increase in lake levels, especially along the shore of Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair, where we have a number of our conservation areas. Um, so here at Holiday Beach had a huge impact. Uh, we used to have probably about a, at least 100, 150 feet of beach here. Um, that's all gone now, partially been eroded away and part of it is simply under the water now because lake levels have simply come up and, and overtaken it. Um, behind me is one of the original trees that were in the park. 
um, which uh, this tree was inland probably 100 feet at one point. But now, as you can see, not only are we at the water's edge here, but actually vertically, um, if you actually take a look um, of, of where this tree actually used to sit, we've actually lost probably four, maybe even five feet of land down. Um, so it's simply gone and Holiday Beach has essentially lost its beach over the last number of years because of the high lake levels and erosion. We've tried to overcome that through a variety of means. Um, we've had to try to protect some of our infrastructure, but ultimately um, we simply had to retreat uh, backwards uh, into the park as we watched all of this land disappear before our very eyes. The one piece of infrastructure that we have had to put in along the shoreline is our break wall. We had to put in a break wall to protect our beach washroom because if we didn't put the break wall in, um, we may have lost the structure completely um, due to the lake, unfortunately. Um, at some point, we're hoping lake levels actually recede um, and we again have a beach, but the impact has been uh, astronomical in terms of the, the natural vegetation along the shoreline. So the tree behind me here, that's one of about probably 30 trees that we've lost over the last two or three years. So we have a lot of issues uh, associated with erosion in the park and, and there's not much we can really do about it, unfortunately. Uh, we just have to deal with what Mother Nature uh, sends our way as it relates to these high lake levels and, and erosion along our shoreline. Uh, today, where I'm standing is uh, right in the middle of what, what is a parking lot, believe it or not. Because the lake levels have g risen so high uh, for the last two springs, um, or three springs actually, we've had to actually block off all these parking areas because they've been flooded. Lake Erie actually floods back into the marsh and then elevates the water levels completely uh, within our wetland. And what that means is that low-lying areas like this parking lot are actually sitting under six inches to a foot of water. Um, and they stay like that for months. Um, and we're actually seeing responses. We're starting to even see cattails growing in our parking lots. Um, we're here now in fall when water levels have just dropped about a foot, and that means that they're dry now. Ironically, um, when these areas are covered in water, they actually are teeming with wildlife. So Slight interruption, everybody. Um, we'll see if we can get the rest of the video queued up here. Uh, just give us one moment. Ryan, if you can just share the video once more from where we left off, that would be great. Just stand by one. <laughs> Okay, almost there, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Tori. Sorry, what uh, did the video cut out? It did, yes. If you could just unshare the screen and reshare the uh, Kevin's presentation from where we left off, if you're able to. Okay, you just got to tell me where we left off because it just was continuing to play with no issue at my end because it's on my machine, so I don't know where it. Okay. Oh, we're at the parking lot. Um, I would say there's probably around a couple minutes left. Okay, sorry folks, bear with me one second. Thanks everyone. There is an order to try to delay along the shore, but ultimately uh, the natural Geary actually floods back into the marsh and with erosion in the park and, and there's not much we can really do about it. All right, press play, we're good.
unfortunately. Uh, we just have to deal with what Mother Nature uh, sends our way as it relates to these high lake levels and, and erosion along our shoreline. Uh, today, where I'm standing is uh, right in the middle of what, what is a parking lot, believe it or not. Because the lake levels have risen so high uh, for the last two springs, um, or three springs actually, we've had to actually block off all these parking areas because they've been flooded. Lake Erie actually floods back into the marsh and then elevates the water levels completely uh, within our wetland. And what that means that low-lying areas like this parking lot are actually sitting under six inches to a foot of water. Um, and they stay like that for months. Um, and we're actually seeing responses. We're starting to even see cattails growing in our parking lots. Um, we're here now in fall when water levels have just dropped about a foot, and that means that they're dry now. Ironically, um, when these areas are covered in water, they actually are teeming with wildlife. So it's a bit of a unique thing where we have a parking lot that right now that also actually doubles as as a habitat for wildlife in the future what we'd like to do is elevate this parking lot a little bit um, so we don't have this ongoing issue um, and uh, we have to look at that going forward Okay, thanks for bearing with us through those technical difficulties, folks. Um, and thank you so much, Kevin, um, for sharing this video with us and to all the contributing staff at Essex Region for, for building such a beautiful video. Um, that was really well done. I, uh, I would love to book that cabin as soon as I can. <laughs> um, so next up, we do have uh, Team North Bay Mattawa, um, their virtual site tour uh, to share with you all. Um, it is worth noting that North Bay is a two-time Innovation Award winner uh, and the current recipient since 2019. Um, so I do hear and see, uh, unfortunately you can't, but the bear is standing by um, and he is wearing a mask. <laughs> um, so we're going to queue up uh, North Bay's video for you all um, and we do hope you enjoy. Ryan, there's no audio if you would just mind unsharing and queuing up the audio. Okay, we'll give this another try. There we go. Hi everyone, welcome to the North Bay Mattawa Conservation Authority and the Laurentian Escarpment Conservation Area and our head office. This is a, a tower that we're located at here overlooking the city of North Bay. It's at our head office and uh, we're very lucky to uh, be able to work out of this office and have the teams that we do. The Conservation Authority owns 15 conservation areas within our watershed. It uh, cones or co-manages and co-owns one, which is right in the heart of town here. Another group owns 50% of that property. That's unique because I don't think another CA in the province of Ontario is as a, as a 50% owner of a conservation area. This conservation area is uh, quite nice. It's on the face of the escarpment. It stretches out uh, quite a piece to uh, all of our trails that are on the edge of the escarpment. We certainly own one block here, but we have partnerships to manage all the trails. There's about 25 kilometers, 30 kilometers of trail here. It, reaching out now, the other 14 uh, conservation areas are, are more rural and uh, they're about an hour, hour and a half away. The farthest one's about that distance, hour and a half away, and, and they're spread out along the landscape here in, in uh, Nipissing. Below me here is also the ski hill for North Bay, uh, Laurentian Ski Hill Snowboard Club. So that's a partnership that we do and let's get out and have a look at these trails and uh, you'll be able to see the conservation areas. And let me uh, grab the bear here since he'll be staying with us for another year and uh, we'll go and uh, visit the areas with you. All of our conservation areas have bear proof uh, garbage cans, um, particularly the spring and the fall, the bears are particularly busy getting ready for hibernation and coming out of hibernation. Not all of our conservation areas have washrooms. 
Um, we closed them for the winter season. And during COVID, we had the added expense, I'm sure like everyone else did, of having them cleaned uh, twice a day by a cleaning crew that we contracted to come in and uh, do those to keep things safe and help prevent the spread of uh, COVID-19. Our conservation areas are posted with permitted uses and prohibited uses um, about the noise. There's no hunting. There's no motorized vehicles uh, permitted in any of the conservation areas. This uh, is the Kate Paceway Trail and the Kingsman Trail that run through the urban part of the city in North Bay. This trail is about 15 kilometers long. It's paved, it's multi-use, and it's extremely busy. We found during COVID that this trail was highly used. People had to get outside and move around during the lockdown period. And we've noticed uh, you know, an increase of visitation for sure. This is an expensive trail for us, it's asphalt. It's a, it's a long trail and you can imagine the cost in repaving. So every year we phase in an asphalt um, section that gets done and we try to cover it over in 20 years. Having said that, there is uh, other uses on this trail, and that is uh, the uh, OFSC, which is the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs, uses the portion of the trail from basically Calendar, which is the southern end or the east end of this trail, and it works its way to the north. We allow the snowmobiles on it because it joins Lake Nipissing and then all our surrounding municipalities and it creates a huge economic benefit to the city of North Bay and all our municipalities. So you can imagine if there's a problem, like with the bridge deck, that if that bridge isn't in place, we're in a serious economic problem. Safe and engineered check and meet all the standards that we need to do to keep that open. The Cape Paceway and the Kingsman Trail are a great asset in the city of North Bay and, 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 and even an asset to the to Canada because it's part of the Trans Canada Trail. Hi, welcome to Eau Claire Gorge Conservation Area. It's great to be here today to show off our gem in Calvin Township, which is about 30 minutes outside of North Bay. Uh, this park is a big, beautiful park, about 400 and so acres. It has a huge waterfalls of, uh, you know, 60 feet high and it drops down through a gorge. This property is uh, is owned by the Conservation Authority for the purposes of uh, historic information, uh, cultural information, and uh, protection. Our trails, uh, they wander their way through the property and so people can get some uh, recreation and some exercise while going to the gorge. Uh, we have some infrastructure here on the property just with uh, both our outdoor washrooms. We have a cabin. It's a historical cabin. It's where the loggers used to live actually while they were working on this property. Uh, they stayed in the cabin while they logged. They had their horses outside the cabin. They did all their cooking there. They used the water from the river in Smith Lake. And so this is the place where they stayed to do their work. And that cabin has deteriorated over the years, but we've also kept it up. Hey, good morning. Built by Lumberjacks. Amazing carpentry. All these joints are all dovetailed. This was all done by hand. I mean, you would struggle to do that with the chainsaw. And these guys have done that by hand. You know, every piece is interlocked, so no nails and no way it could ever come apart. Seven, eight years ago, we replaced the cedar shake and replaced the moss on the roof, which is we replaced the windows. We replaced a few deck boards. We replaced these ones this year just in front of the step because they're the heaviest travel. This cabin, this logging that happened years ago was part of, um, you know, a system that took place to build ships uh, overseas. They, they would cut the logs on the land and they're huge white pine and hemlock. Up, they would um, drag them with horses to the river to traverse them down the rivers, basically the Ottawa River and the Mattawa River. Oh, well, this is the bridge we're planning on replacing. Uh, it's known as Bridge Two. It's about a 20 foot drop underneath. This bridge currently is about 25 feet. The new one's closer to 33. It'll be a little bit longer, a little bit safer above it. And uh, we're going to use what's called a self healing steel. So it will look rusty but that's the look of it. It's meant to look like it's been here for a hundred years. That bridge crosses um, um, a log spillway, a log chute. And so that that's about 12 to 14 feet deep. It's about five meters wide, so 20 feet wide. And what they did was they dammed up the river to shoot the logs through. 
So this is a bridge that uh, gets people over to the point where they can see the falls and enjoy the uh, the uh, 40 foot waterfalls that's there in the park. We had a set of steps that uh, probably 30, 40 year old railroad tie steps that went right along the edge of the river. Uh, starting to rot, no railing, right beside a cliff into a raging river, very, very dangerous. So what we've done is we've closed those stairs and created this switchback. So a switchback is gonna go back and forth up the hillside, much safer than falling right down beside the river. So guests of the park now, you know, instead of going alongside the cliff the whole way, you see the waterfall from the bottom, you still see it at the top. So you can see through here that it's got quite a slope. We cut that, it's called a bench cut. So you cut into the slope of the hill, fold it over, and that creates a nice little tread. The only real work is to build up some of the corners, which we've done with brand new cedar, fresh cedar, eight inch piece at least. So they'll hold for quite some time. And by the time they're done, it should be filled in with vegetation to hold that corner. There's all kinds of different uh, things that do happen here, but the hikes are interesting because we do, um, we do, we do many hikes that, that are for educational purposes, obviously. So we bring school groups out, we bring the general public out and they'll be to identify trees, look at the flora and fauna of the park. And we, we often bring in specialists that can describe the different uh, species and talk about uh, the significance of those species within the area. It is uh, truly um, uh, interesting to, to see this area and to visit the area. And lots of people come from all over the world to, uh, to visit the site here. We, we hear from many people through emails and uh, they, they just love to come here. So Welcome to the Lamaze Portage Conservation Area. This is one of our historic conservation areas that featured natural and historic features. This is part of a Trans-Canada commuter route who was first traversed by uh, the Nipissing and the Algonquins, uh, Indigenous peoples as a, as a route, a canoe route between two watersheds. Um, and in about the 1600s, it became part of the major canoe route across Canada for the fur trade with Etienne Brule and Samuel de Chatelet discovered. The voyagers hated this route. It was filled with bog, um, beaver dams, wet spots. So it was quite the route for them to traverse back in the 1600s. It's amazing to think of the voyagers with 32 foot canoes weighing 300 pounds, loaded with 300 pounds of goods, going from this lake, Brandy Lake, across the way into Trout Lake. Uh, we have a trail that loops through down to the pond and a lookout. We also have an osprey nest platform, as well as beaver baffles set in here at Brandy Lake. And then there's a little route to cross the highway that goes into Trout Lake. There's always been great public interest in the Vaz Portage. Uh, when there was some private land that came up for sale, a group of local citizens came together with the Conservation Authority uh, to purchase that land and to ensure that it stayed within um, public hands to preserve the historic connection it has. The Friends of La Vaz Portage, they hold annually every year a canoe reenactment where they take the public through the routes, they threw the 11 kilometers and guide them through so that they can experience what the voyagers experienced when they came through here. We had an awesome partnership with uh, three of our local high schools as part of their ICE program and their high skills major program in terms of looking at what they could do to help with species at risk. So here in this area in the Lavaz Portage Conservation Areas, it's Habitat for Blanding's Turtles. So what we did with a grant from the Great Lakes Guardian was constructed a number of turtle mounds brought in gravel because just across the way is Highway 17 and we all know that the great risk to one of the great risks to turtles is uh, roadkill. So them accessing the gravel that's on the side of the highway. So the Elks Lodge Family Park Conservation Area is on the shores of Trout Lake. It's one of the beaches that we manage and monitor and look after. Um, Trout Lake is important to our community in part because it's the source of our municipal drinking water. So there is drinking water source protection plans and policies in place to protect the lake. Uh, Trout Lake is again part of the Heritage Wizard Canadian Heritage River system designation. It flows into the Mattawa River. It's also home to the 
beginning of the uh, Mattawa River Canoe Race that we hold every year, uh, which is 64 kilometers from North Bay to Mattawa, which is beautiful and grueling and a great challenge to paddlers who come both in kayaks, canoes, and actually paddle boards too. Papano Lake Conservation Area is, uh, it's about 40 minutes out of Mattawa and that's just because it's down a, a dirt road, uh, Sturgeon Lake Road. So it's a cold water lake, 563 acres in total. It's a fair size. It's about 80 feet deep at its deepest point with a mean depth of about 30 feet, making it an ideal lake trout fishery. So for local fishermen or anybody willing to make a drive, great lake trout fishing right here at Papadal Lake. Uh, removing our aluminum dock. The dock first went in in 2017 to replace an old cantilever dock system. Uh, this new one's aluminum and the ice will absolutely destroy it. So we got to put it in the spring. We take it out every fall. Mattawa Island Conservation Area is a small island on the Mattawa River just before it hits the Ottawa. Uh, we have a few amenities here in this conservation area, tennis court, volleyball court, uh, basketball court, and a really nice beach with shallow water. Uh, Mattawa is also the place where Big Joe Muffra paddled all the way from Ottawa in just one day. That's upriver. So Laurier Woods Conservation Area is a 97 hectare, 240 acre conservation area with six and a half kilometers of trails and a number of uh, amenities in the property as well that are managed. We co-own and manage this property with friends of Laurier Woods and there is a management agreement in place and the friends of Laurier Woods are a great support and a great help in terms of all of their volunteers and Laurier Woods conservation area is highlighted by a provincially significant wetland, rocky outcrops, and an upland forest. The trails have a number of features and amenities in terms of lookout platforms, boardwalks, we have a bee hotel, a dipping platform, and we have something very special and unique in terms of Forest Talk Radio, which actually we were awarded the Conservation Awards Innovation Award for. So Forest Talk Radio is a partnership that we have with a local media artist and where people can upload an app to, and have a story told about the forest um, that's been creatively done by a local multi multimedia artist. Laurier Woods is home to 33 species of nesting birds and it is a real highlight and feature during the migration of birds through the spring and through the fall. We also have here at Laurier Woods a memorial bench or picnic table program where donations can be made in honor of or memory of an individual and we'll place a bench or a picnic table in their memory. Laurier Woods Conservation Area is really the inspiration and the birthplace for our Love Them and Leash Them campaign that we put in place because there was a great issue of dogs running off leash here in the conservation area. Um, causing concern for the people who were afraid and were being bothered by the dogs off leash. So as part of the Love Them and Leash Them campaign, we partnered with a local business um, and installed these pet waste dispensers, um, the sponsorship from Lisa's Dog House to encourage people to uh, clean up after their dogs here in the conservation area. When Love Them and Leash Them was, uh, when we were using the campaign, we incorporated radio advertisements. We also had giveaways for the little portable um, poop bags containers and gave to people when we found that they were being appropriately keeping their dogs on leash and thanking them as a reward. Um, there we also had people who were handing out brochures and flyers and explaining things to people about why it's important to keep your dogs on leash, not only for the enjoyment of the people within the conservation area, but for protection of the wildlife within the conservation area. This is the B Hotel that we have here at Laurier Woods. It was a project that was constructed by our summer students one year under the guidance of our land staff. Um, its purpose is to teach and educate about solitary bees and about the importance of pollinators to our ecosystem. So here in Laurier Woods, we had one trail loop that was not connected due to the, the wetland. Um, and the resources that were needed to build a bridge to go across it. So fortunately, we were approached by a local citizen um, who was willing to donate the time and the money and uh, the effort to help us build this 160 foot boardwalk in memory of his uh, son-in-law who passed away on an outdoor accident. So we've named this one Michael's Boardwalk in honor of of Michael. 
So construction on Michael's boardwalk began last winter uh, when we did the species at risk, risk search on it. There were two species at risk identified in the area, um, gypsy, gypsy bumblebees and the Blanding's turtles. So construction in the winter enable us to ensure the safety of that. So where the cribs were marked on the ice, the ice removed and then poles put into the ground uh, down into the bed to make sure that anything was cleared away. If it was possible that there were any blending turtles wintering in the bottom where the cribs were going to go. So the cribs were placed in the winter and then when spring came, the decking and the rest of the construction uh, went ahead. In 2010, the Conservation Authority, City of North Bay, North Bay Heritage Gardeners and Nipsey Botanical Gardens, now Trees for Nipsey, came together um, to create Chippewa Creek Eco Path. The project Chippewa Creek Eco Path is a community initiative to restore and enhance the natural values and heritage of Chippewa Creek through stewardship and education. The Chippewa Creek Eco Path engages the community in many different ways. We have the education program for schools and teachers. We have an EcoPath Festival annually that invites other environmental organizations to come out and do an activity with the public to learn about the environment. The Adopt a Creek program, our environmental curriculum on our website, our tree planting events, our cleanups along the creek, our EcoPath Berry Patch, and our two tree nurseries along the path. Through the grant, we installed two of these kiosk signs as well as eight interpretive desks along the path. The path is 3.2 kilometers that runs from Thompson Park all the way down here to Lake Nipissing. We're here at the Nipissing Starter Nursery. This nursery was started two years ago in collaboration with Trees for Nipissing, Living Fit Inside Out Women's Club, and with the great support of TD Friends of the Environment, Watson Landscaping, and Rona, and Eagle Tree Services. So the last two years, each year, we've planted 900 seedlings of different species of trees and shrubs. Some of the species planted here would be some silver maples, some red maples, some tamaracks, some cedars. All the species that we plant in our nurseries are native species to the area. Um, this is an, an accessible nursery, so people can come out and uh, go around them and have a look. All the trees were planted through a program called Grandparents Planting Trees. So grandparents would come out with their grandchildren and come out and plant some trees for us. Some of them are planted near the waterfront, some are planted along Chippewa Creek. Well, we made it back. What a great time. I just want to thank uh, everybody for tuning into the webinars um, and learning uh, so much from each other. The Conservation Areas Workshop has been going for years and it's been a great thing to have so we can collaborate and communicate, learn best practices and all that stuff. It's been real trying this year, especially with COVID. Um, we've spent money and we've done things we've never done before. I think we've learned lots and we've, we've changed things and done many different things. So kudos to all of you out there for doing that. I, I know I, I mentioned that in other meetings that I sit on is the conservation area staff have been great across the province to keep parks open and keep people outside and, and uh, moving around during this time. So yeah, we're closing up here with this webinar in North Bay. And again, you're you're at our Laurentian Scarborough Conservation Area and um, our staff have put this together and I'd like to thank Paula Laranger who works for the Conservation Authority, Sue Buckle, who's our manager of outreach and communications. She's done a wonderful job getting this piece done. And I wanna thank all the conservation authorities that took part. And I know that uh, we'll be having a conference again soon. And I think the bear is gonna stay with us for an extra year because I don't think he's gonna wanna leave North Bay for a while. So take care everyone. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, I'm on, I'm on, I'm live. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much North Bay and for all contributing staff. Um, that was, that was fantastic. Oh my goodness. Um, just to note that we will send um, these videos out to our attendees. Uh, so if you did miss any portion of any video for any technical difficulties or what have you, um, you will have the videos eventually. Um, this is happened to be a YouTube link so you can watch it on your own time. Um, I also want to remind everyone uh, that there is a Q&A feature. Um, so if you do have questions for individual presenters or to all presenters, please um, 
post your questions in the Q&A box um, and we'll answer these at the end of all three of our presentations um, and also stay tuned for our final special presentation um, at the end of our Q&A. Um, so up next, I do want to welcome Ryan Mackett uh, from Lakehead Region uh, and he is also from our very own Conservation Areas uh, Workshop Committee. Um, so thank you, Ryan, and I'll pass it off to you. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Tori. This has uh, been quite uh, hard acts to follow up, I'll be perfectly honest. Those two videos were incredible and uh, kind of mind blowing with some of the stuff that uh, you all have to offer. Um, as I'm chatting here, I'm gonna awkwardly try and start sharing my screen. So I'm, I'm doing a, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not quite at the same level as you other crew here, and I don't know why my PowerPoint disappeared, but give me a second here. Tori, if you can cut in and just let me know uh, if it is appearing on screen. I see your full screen PowerPoint, yep. Okay, and I hope I clicked share system audio. Uh, I guess we'll find out when I get to that point. Um, anyways, okay, great. Thank you so much. My name is Ryan Mackett. I'm the communications manager with the Lakehead Region Conservation Authority here in Thunder Bay. Um, and I kind of want to echo Troy's words at the end of his video and just uh, give a shout out to, to everybody across the province that's just been working uh, so hard and with, you know, limited staff and double the visitors and all of the heartache and issues that that comes with and uh, not to mention everyone else that's been working hard at trying to decipher uh, all that Schedule 11 stuff. So anyways, um, Lakehead Region, Region Conservation Authority, uh, our vision is a healthy, safe and sustainable Lakehead watershed for future generations. And our mission is to lead the conservation and protection of the Lakehead watershed. You all know this map. This is the lovely 36 conservation authorities of the province of Ontario. And I'm assuming you can see my uh, mouse cursor here. Um, the inset map is the, the five in the north. Uh, so over here is Lakehead. Now it doesn't really kind of give you a good context of where exactly we are. And when Ryan Gilliam, our lands manager and I, travel down for uh, uh, the CA's workshop year after year. We're usually met with like, uh, if you, you know, how, how is the drive? Well, we don't drive. Uh, it would be about 13 hours and 50 minutes if we were to drive from Thunder Bay to Aurelia. So we fly uh, and the flights are usually pretty good, two hours and then we drive up from Pearson to Aurelia. Um, our area of jurisdiction is the pink area shown on this map. Um, and it's 2,719.2 square kilometers. However, the scientific boundary of the Lakehead watershed is over 11,500 square kilometers. So I believe we are one of two, I think, conservation authorities in the province whose areas of jurisdiction are uh, municipal boundaries as opposed to watershed boundaries. Um, when you look at, I'm going to go back one here, when you look at the uh, Lake Superior shoreline uh, of our area of jurisdiction. Um, this basically shows the drive from the topmost part of our area of jurisdiction, which is at Hercut Cove conservation area, all the way down to the Pigeon River border crossing, which is the bottom end of our area of jurisdiction at the US Canada border. And that's about 143 kilometers, uh, about an hour and 40 minutes driving time, depending on I don't want to say traffic because we don't really have a lot of that up here, but depending on driving conditions. Um, and so like our lands manager, you know, that's basically the longest that he would have to travel to check out those two areas. Uh, Little Trout Bay is down in this area. But what's interesting is that this same route, uh, about 143 kilometers or an hour and 40 minutes of driving, would basically take you from St. Catharines to the Ajax area. Um, so just that might give you guys down south a bit of uh, context about what our you know area of jurisdiction is like. Um, but what's really interesting is that this route from St. Catharines to Ajax crosses through five conservation authority areas of jurisdiction, Niagara, Hamilton, Halton, Credit Valley, and Toronto and region. I just thought that was a neat little uh, factoid. 
As far as the LRCA, our, our land holdings, uh, we own a total of 2,500 hectares of land, um, in addition to our eight recreational conservation areas and two publicly uh, accessible forest management properties. We own uh, several other properties here, um, which I, I won't read out to you, but the significant ones are uh, Williams Forest at 554 hectares and uh, uh, just random floodplain lands throughout the watershed, uh, about 130 hectares. Uh, one of our key um, pieces of infrastructure uh, is the Niebing McIntyre floodway. And you can see in this image here, this aerial shot, um, this is the widened, deepened floodway channel where it outlets into Lake Superior and the floodway channel kind of snakes its way up this way um, where it would connect to uh, the McIntyre River and the Niebing River. And I have, this is where we're going to see if this works. Um, oh, wait, no, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Uh, Neby McIntyre Floodway provides uh, our intercity area and lower Nebing River from riverine flooding, which is designed uh, uh, to up to and including the regional storm. Uh, this is what the intercity area looked like just prior to the floodway being created. So you can see uh, pretty significant flooding in the area, um, which is, uh, you know, the main reason why we exist um, and this is uh, this is basically what the floodplain in that area looks like after the floodway so you can see uh, with my pointer here um, this is the Niebing River coming down and this is the McIntyre River uh, this is the diversion channel and this is the floodway proper the widened deepened floodway where it outlets into Lake Superior uh, prior to the floodway this is what the floodplain would look like in that area um, so you can see it's a pretty significant amount of flood mitigation and all of this area is heavily, heavily developed. We've got shopping centers, movie theater, uh, Canadian Lakehead exhibition uh, sites, uh, grounds, um, you know, Home Depot. None of that would be possible without our floodway. And how does it work? We're going to see, Tori, can you tell me if you can hear this, please? I can hear it, Ryan. Thank you. was our little uh, newly created floodway animation video. Um, we, you know, a lot of people don't realize what the floodway is, why it exists, what it does. So we thought the best way that we can kind of easily communicate that with the public is through a cool little video, which we've been sharing on social media. Um, these are just a few uh, um, uh, shots of the floodway itself. So uh, in the top left corner, you'll see this is the actual diversion structure. So that's basically the um, the, the dam, so to speak, that once it hits capacity, it'll start diverting the water uh, down the diversion channel. Um, and then there's a couple other shots. And then, of course, at the mouth of the floodway, you're you're uh, greeted with a beautiful view of the sleeping giant. 
Uh, biodiversity of the floodway is pretty impressive. There's always uh, tons of uh, wildlife and, and birds and, and creatures that live in the in the diversion channel. Um, it, it gets to be a bit contentious at times because every few years we do have to do maintenance dredging of the diversion channel and uh, people will get very upset that we are removing habitat, which it is true we are doing that. But um, we just have to remind people that this uh, structure exists first and foremost as a flood mitigation uh, method. and um, you know, I can guarantee you that as mad as people get when we have to dredge, they would be a lot madder if they were flooding out down river um, because we didn't do proper maintenance of the floodway. Um, I love this quote. This is uh, um, no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they haven't never experienced. And that comes from Sir David Attenborough. Uh, who is the voice of pretty much every nature documentary we, uh, we've we ever seen. Um, and it fits really well with the LRCA's sort of explore uh, motto for our conservation areas. Um, we obviously pride ourselves on the areas that we have to offer and they've been seeing tons of increased usage during COVID. Um, this is a shot of uh, Hazelwood Lake, which when you go out at the right time of uh, the day, it's like a sheet of glass and is absolutely beautiful. Um, this is an overview of where our conservation areas are located. Um, we have five on Lake Superior. There are three forest management properties that we own, operate and maintain, two of which are open to the public. One of them is landlocked, so it is not open to the public. Um, we have several na natural areas that are also closed. Um, they're just sort of properties that we have. And our CAs are used for uh, recreation, education. Um, they're acquired through donations, purchase or lease. Um, we also own, like I mentioned earlier, floodplain uh, lands and, you know, nature reserves. And uh, obviously we pay property taxes on all of our uh, all of our conservation areas. Um, this is a shot at uh, Hercut Cove Conservation Area, which is another probably my favorite. Uh, you'll probably hear me say that a few times in this presentation, but yeah, one of my favorites. Um, and we have some scenic waterfalls and rivers and lakeside settings and uh, we have uh, nature trails, excellent bird watching. Actually, Hercut Cove is a, is a really good birding hotspot. Um, we have two boat launches and over 28 kilometers of trails. Um, I mean, you guys all know what conservation areas are are used for um, and what they're popular for. But what I will say is that the LRCA um, does not offer any of the amenities um, or any real um, other than passive recreation. So we don't have uh, flowing water washrooms or power or cabins or camping or hunting or anything. So we're a little bit more rustic in terms of what our offerings are. Um, and I also want to share now, some of you may have seen this. We played this video a few years ago um, at the conservation areas workshop. So for those of you who have already seen it, uh, sorry, you got to watch it again. And those of you who haven't, we hired a local uh, videographer a few years ago to put together a promotional video for us. And uh, we're still blown away by the quality of what he was able to put together over the course of a year. And uh, this video can kind of show you what you would expect from visiting uh, the Lakehead region.
OK, so hopefully that worked. I had uh, some feedback from a few of my colleagues that the video froze and they only heard sound. So if it didn't work, I'm not going to play it again. It's on our YouTube channel and I can share it out to everyone after. Um, and that was courtesy of Damien uh, Gilbert at Epica Pictures. And just as a real funny little uh, aside here on his first day of shooting was when you saw those really nice uh, sunrise, those icy sunrise shots near the beginning of the video. And uh, he showed up at Little Trout Bay Conservation Area with his uh, assistant and met Ryan Gilliam out there in running shoes and skinny jeans and a heavy hoodie. And it was minus 45 with the wind chill. And I think after that first shoot for us was when he went to a local uh, outfitter and purchased a proper winter coat and some winter boots. Um, but yeah, it gets cold here. Um, so first thing I want to do is I'm going to take, or what I'm going to do next is I'm going to take you through a uh, lightning round of visiting all of our conservation areas. We're going to start with Hercut Cove Conservation Area. Um, it's about 125 hectares and we have about a two kilometer trail. It's a one way trail out this peninsula. So Lake Superior up here, uh, is part of Black Bay. This little bay is Cranberry Bay, and those are all reeds. People think that that's ice, but those are actually like reeds and, and vegetation in, in the water there. Uh, this is our birding hot spot. Uh, you see the uh, 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 overhead shot of our trails and uh, the property that we own. We actually own property on the other side of the conservation area proper. Um, the yellow here is where our trail is. All of this other property is not developed in any way. Um, it's just, it just sits there, um, but is habitat to many, many, many different species of uh, birds and wildlife and bears and wolves and all the rest of it. Um, and as I said, it's a birding hot spot. Uh, you're guaranteed to see a bald eagle if you go there because there's a active bald eagle's nest right on our trail. We put in some boardwalk a few years ago. Um, and again, we host our annual uh, birding festival. Um, well, we took it over last year um, and it's a hugely popular event. Uh, next up, we're going to go to Mackenzie Point Conservation Area. This is a tiny little rock outcrop into Lake Superior. Um, it's very popular for like sunrise photography and like yoga and stuff like that, but there's it's really nothing much to it. Um, it's this area here and you can see we have property owners adjacent to us and, you know, with any area you have struggles and challenges and here um, some people as this area became or is becoming more and more popular, um, people get upset that their own personal private conservation area is no longer their exclusive getaway and they have to share it with the general public. So it's always a juggling act and a, uh, a struggle, but uh, it's a beautiful spot. Uh, just down the road is Silver Harbor Conservation Area. Um, this is one of our uh, two boat launches into Lake Superior. Um, there's not really a trail. Uh, there's a little trail that goes out onto this uh, spit of land here. Um, but uh, this site, what's really interesting about this site is that all of the rock that makes up the break wall surrounding Thunder Bay um, was quarried from Silver Harbor Conservation Area. So the reason why this uh, mooring area exists is because of the ships that would take the uh, the rock, the quarry rock, to go build the break wall. Um, and you can see here, so this spit of land here and the boat launch area is that tiny little spot here. So again, you'll see that our property holding is fairly significant, um, but we also own a significant amount of water lot um, at Silver Harbor. Um, it's a great, beautiful spot, very picturesque. There's cliffs, dramatic cliffs that people go cliff jumping off of. They're not supposed to, but they do anyways. Um, and it's a, it's a huge, hugely popular access point to Lake Superior. Um, I'll also mention it's the uh, the least compliant area of our uh, of our conservation areas in terms of parking uh, payment, coin box revenue. We get about 0.89% of people pay um, to use those lovely boat launches. But let me tell you, they'll sure let us know if those uh, dock boards are loose, but uh, trying to get $2 for parking is another story. But we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Mission Island Marsh Conservation Area, which is our, it usually uh, fights 
between Mission and Cascades for the most popular conservation area each year. Um, this is a small little hidden gem in the middle of the city. Um, very, very popular. And what's really interesting about Mission Island Marsh is that this meadow area where you can see all the goldenrod, um, this used to actually be the Fort William landfill site. Um, so before amalgamation, Thunder Bay used to be two separate cities, Fort William and Port Arthur. Um, so Fort William landfill was right here. Uh, so we always use this area as a great educational tool to just show the power of nature and especially with some human stewardship to help it along, uh, just what is possible. Um, we have a fairly small trail system, but what's unique about it is that there are four distinct ecosystems at Mission Island Marsh. So we have a lagoon, uh, a wetland, uh, or sorry, a lagoon ecosystem, a coastal wetland ecosystem, a meadow ecosystem, and a forest ecosystem. And we have a great partnership with Ontario Power Generation who have uh, helped us uh, with our Mission Marsh Learning Trails initiative with some interpretive signage and uh, partial funding towards paving uh, one of the trails here. Um, it's another super popular birding site. You're guaranteed to see deer if you come out here. It's all, you know, go to Mission and feed the deer. Um, it's, it, it's a great, great spot. Very popular for our education programming as well. Um, a couple of years ago now, we commissioned a local um, metal artist uh, to do a new entrance sign, um, and this is what he came up with, and it's absolutely stunning. It's uh, primarily made up of that rust steel that was mentioned in the North Bay video, um, where it's designed to look rusty after weather, um, but it's also uh, it also features some stainless steel uh, birds. So there's a nice contrast. It's a beautiful, beautiful sign and we're really proud of it. It's like a little pub piece of public art. Um, one of the big issues that we face at Mission Marsh is erosion. And as was outlined uh, in the Essex video, uh, erosion and high lake levels on Lake Superior are, um, uh, are, are doing tons of damage. And uh, basically this map, this overhead map shows the rate of uh, erosion of land that we've lost since uh, 1996. Um, the dotted yellow line is where the land was in 96. Um, the thatched lime green line represents the shoreline on October 9th, 2019. And the solid dark blue line represents the shoreline on October 22nd, 2019. Um, and just to kind of zoom in here, so um, the, the lime green and the dark blue line, the difference there is the land that we lost overnight during a pretty significant storm uh, um, in October of last year of 2019. Um, so I'm just gonna show you, Ryan, our lands manager was at mission the day the storm started, and this is what he saw. That was that was earlier in the afternoon. Um, that night was when the storm hit. I should mention that that boardwalk used to be built on land, um, and then it became a, a, a water bridge, basically. Um, that was the next morning. Um, and this empty space that you can see is where Ryan was standing when he filmed that, uh, that little video. Um, so a significant amount of damage was done to our boardwalk overnight, a uh, significant amount of erosion to the shoreline. Uh, this nice crusher fine trail that you can kind of see here was I believe at the time the third instance that Ryan and his team had rerouted uh, this trail because of the creeping erosion. Um, so we, we did it again and we have it going further into the woods now. Um, and you can see here where the trail kind of just goes away. Um, so it's an issue that we've been dealing with and we're, we're waiting to see what what mechanism uh, we have access to to either replace, repair or remove uh, depending on funds and, and everything else. But everything was put on hold because of, of COVID as I'm sure you can all imagine. Uh, Little Trout Bay Conservation Area is the other boat launch that we have. Um, also hugely popular. Um, what's interesting is that this is our best compliancy um, conservation area. 
And the, a, a lot of the money that we pull out of the coin box here is American money um, because there's a lot of Americans that come up uh, and this is their first real good access point to Lake Superior. And um, it just we in our in our experiences, it seems that uh, the Americans that visit our area um, have no issue whatsoever uh, paying to, to launch their boat. Um, it's about 18 hectares. You can see this little uh, relatively short loop trail that we have just adjacent to the parking lot. But we do have another trail across the road that we hadn't had open in many years. But recently, um, the Nature Conservancy of Canada purchased Big Trout Bay um, and a huge swath of property that conveniently connects to ours. So we kind of have a joint trail with them, uh, the James Duncan Memorial Trail, which is quite significant and absolutely beautiful and takes at least a day to walk the whole trail. So you kind of have to park at both trailheads, take two vehicles. Um, and this is Ryan's little fox friend that he met out at, uh, at Little Trout and we host regular public events here and it's a beautiful, beautiful spot. Um, moving inland a little bit, we have Cedar Falls Conservation Area, which is near Kekebeka Falls. Uh, this is another little hidden gem of an area, uh, very simple conservation area. There's a short trail, no washroom or anything, and it takes you down to um, the small falls um, on Cedar Creek, and it's one of my favorites. I won't say my favorite, but definitely one of my favorite areas. Uh, Hazelwood Lake Conservation Area you'll see is just outside of our area of jurisdiction, but we do uh, own property here. Um, this is uh, our crown jewel, I guess you could say. Uh, we have about seven kilometers of trails at this site and the area itself that we own is 618 hectares. Um, and what's interesting is that the LRCA owns the entire lake bed of Hazelwood Lake. It is a man-made lake, historical man-made lake. We own the lake bed and the majority of the shoreline. Um, so this trail map shows you the conservation area proper. We've got the three different trails, um, a small little parking area. Actually, it's a fairly large parking area right here. There's a beach area as well. Um, but now this area that you're looking at here is this area here of the map and so this map will show you um, exactly what our property holdings are so it's a significant amount of property that we hold and again like i said the lake bed itself ideally at one point if money wasn't an issue we'd love to do a trail that circumnavigates the entire lake um, but that's that's long-term thinking uh, and again it's just a beautiful spot uh, we hold public events here regularly um, and a lot of our education programs come out here uh, Cascades Conservation Area. This is our most popular conservation area. It's about 162 hectares. Uh, we have about five and a half kilometers of trails. Uh, this view that you're looking at here are the, the Cascades themselves. It's the cur uh, current river, uh, the rapids along the current river. Um, and it's the destination that everyone seeks out when they go to Cascades. Um, you'll see the parking lot and then the trail system. And here's another uh, uh, beautiful view of uh, Cascades that's in our most recent calendar that we just produced. Um, I put the picture of the dog on leash in here. We did, we have hosted a few um, uh, agility demos with local dog uh, behavior groups and we've hosted various dog related events here to try and show that the LRCA is uh, we, we all love dogs, but Cascades is by far the area where we get the most complaints about off-leash dogs and we get the most complaints about mountain biking. And uh, it's, it's a very challenging area because of its heav heavy use and popularity. Um, of the majority of the problems that we see come from Cascades, unfortunately, but it's a beautiful spot. Um, Mills Block Forest, uh, this is one of our forest management properties. You can see here, uh, it's super cool. It's it's like a there's a wetland, there's active beaver ponds, and then there's a trail that goes sort of up into higher elevation into the the woods. The um, very popular dog walking spot as well. And then Wishart Forest. Um, it's another uh, forest management property that's open to the public. This map shows you our property holdings, but it doesn't show you our second trail. We do have a trail on this side as well that was closed uh, up until just recently. Um, and there is a bit of harvesting currently happening in Wishart. Uh, it was a very, very old growth forest, so it needed to be cleaned up a little bit. Um, in terms of accessibility, um, 
we have a paved 775 meter loop trail at Cascades Conservation Area. It needs a bit of work at the moment, so I wouldn't go so uh, far as to say that it's AODA compliant. However, the 550 meter paved trail at Mission Island Marsh is AODA compliant, wheelchair accessible. We have a, a, an accessible viewing scope and an accessible bench um, at a viewing area just near the lagoons at, uh, at Mission. And most recently, we were just uh, gifted with or uh, bequeathed a property uh, known as Wakefield Common. And uh, the majority of the property is a provincially significant wetland and regulated area. Um, but it's an absolutely beautiful spot. Um, and we've recently partnered with Lakehead University. Uh, actually, tomorrow, Tammy, Ryan, and myself are going to be watching some presentations from some students who've used this as a hypothetical test site to develop um, an educational and recreational conservation area at this site. Um, and it's awesome. We can't wait to see what happens with that in the future. And here are a few uh, aerial shots. So this is an interesting view. Uh, you can see the wetland. There is a beaver lodge in the middle of the wetland, but then also on the horizon, you can see the sleeping giant in Lake Superior. Um, and this is a top down view of the wetland and uh, uh, beaver lodge area. And, and that really just uh, sums it up for me. Um, our motto is take nothing but pictures and leave nothing but footprints. And uh, I, hope, I hope that was uh, interesting for you all. And at some point when the future allows it, we would love to see any of you up here. So if anyone's coming up to visit and would like a personal tour of any of these areas, feel free. And uh, that's it for me, folks. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, that was an incredible glimpse into a conservation authority that I sincerely hope every Ontarian gets to visit at some point in their lives. Um, I think we actually have three Lakehead University alumni on the committee this year, if I'm not mistaken. Pretty Very cool. cool. <laughs> um, so this does uh, conclude the presentation portion of our webinar. Um, thanks warmly to all of our presenters for sharing. These videos have been incredible. Um, we will jump into our Q&A portion right now. Um, I do see only one question in here uh, for the moment, although I do see a, a note from Brenna here that uh, you, you had an incredible um, uh, graphic uh, image like your your little cartoon to describe the uh, explain the floodway was was really really well done. Um, so we do have one question here for Kevin, um, and it is uh, Cool Cottage. How much revenue does it genuine generate annually? Uh, yeah, thanks. That's a good question. Um, the cottage itself is actually small. It's under a thousand square feet. Um, but because of where it's located, uh, it has no neighbors and it is waterfront. We're able to charge a pretty good premium. Um, we have been charging $200 a night. Uh, we actually just increased it to $225 um, and it's already booked solid for next summer. Um, I don't think there's any uh, availability left really or maybe one week. Um, the, I just I took a quick look and uh, as of right now uh, our gross revenue associated with that one cottage is probably around twenty thousand um, dollars. We probably have about five thousand dollars in expenses associated with it um, primarily related to cleaning staff. Um, so um, that's uh, that tries to provide a, a response in terms of the revenue generated from that one uh, that one facility. OK, thanks, Kevin, very much for that uh, for that question. I think we do have another question coming in. Oh, no, just uh, great presentations, everyone. OK, well, that's wonderful. Um, I mean, if there are no questions, um, it, we'll, we'll answer any other questions. If I missed any that came in by text, I can um, email them out to the group and see if we can provide an answer to our attendees after that. Um, but I did promise. Um, that uh, we do have a short special presentation um, to share with you now. Um, the Conservation Areas uh, Committee and Conservation Ontario are pleased to present an address uh, from the Honourable Minister Jeff Urich, uh, Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. So we're going to queue that up for you, please. Enjoy. Hello, everyone. I want to thank Conservation Ontario for inviting me to help kick off today's workshop. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to speak to you 
as well to your guests from the Lakehead region, Essex region, and North Bay Matawa Conservation Authorities. As the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, and having served as the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, I have met countless people across this great province. And Ontarians are all passionate about their environment and are determined to keep it clean and beautiful. The people who work for conservation authorities share this passion. You recognize our shared responsibility to protect and conserve our national resources and the importance of having clean air to breathe, safe water to drink, and open spaces for our physical and mental health. You are critical to the protection of the sources of our drinking water and work to conserve our natural resources. And as early adopters of the watershed approach, you have helped protect people and property from unpredictable and extreme weather that is aggravated flooding and other natural hazards. This role is becoming even more important with the unpredictable weather events increasingly threatening our homes, businesses and infrastructure while disrupting our communities. Your efforts will be critical to helping Ontario families and businesses continue to prepare for the cost and impact of climate change to their communities. The unprecedented challenges of COVID-19 have affected families, workers, businesses and communities across the province. It has forced organizations like my ministry and the province's conservation authorities to change the way they deliver our services to the people of Ontario. You have adapted to the closure and gradual reopenings of your conservation areas, and you have provided meaningful outdoor experiences for your community members and visitors. Today, we're seeing some positive signs. The news about vaccines is encouraging. It's a reason for optimism. But right now, we need to redouble our efforts to protect ourselves and each other. I appreciate the work you're doing to respond to the challenges of COVID-19 and your continued efforts to protect the health and well-being and of our environment. And I look forward to working with you to help Ontarians get through the COVID-19 outbreak and emerge stronger and better than before. Thank you very much. All right, a warm thank you to Minister Yurik for his acknowledgement and participation. Um, and thank you to those who've remained uh, with us thus far. Uh, I would like to acknowledge our committee members for all their hard work putting this together. Dave Orr, um, my co-chair from CDC, uh, John Messmans from uh, South Nation, Jan Willem LaRose from The Grand, Ryan Mackett from Lakehead Region, Dan Andrews from Lake Simcoe, Brenna Bartley from Halton Region, Liam Fletcher from Hamilton, Brandon Good from Long Point, and Nikisha Mohammed from Conservation Ontario. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank you, our audience, for joining us today, giving us your time if you've been with us for the last three webinars. Um, we really, really had a great time putting it on for you all. And on behalf of the committee, Dave and I, um, thanks everyone. Don't be a stranger and we'll be together again soon.